Reg and Pete from Dog Trumpet. Welcome to Australian Musician. Hey, how are you? Nice to be here. Yes, it is. Dog Trumpet is a band you formed in 1990 while you were still in the mentals. And then in 2000, you left the mentals to concentrate on this band. At the time, did you think it was um, a band that might last a long time, three decades? Well, we didn't, we don't really think about that stuff. You just, you just kind of, just kind of do stuff. And then, you know, and then a, a year or two goes by and you do another album. It's not like we, not like we really sort of, had any long-term plan no it was just it was pretty much the same as the mentals starting up just it was a thing you did at the time and it was you know it, it, you um just do a few gigs and you make some music record some of it and see what happens and yeah, the mentals was the same thing we never had any uh, long-term plans at all there was no amb ambitions beyond you know the following week or the following month same with dog trumpet in a way you know but it's once you once you get rolling it's it just has its own momentum yeah carries you yeah well you're now uh seven albums old um and all seven albums are coming out on vinyl three are available now and the rest are coming out on on feb 4 i'm wondering what was the first vinyl album you each bought with your own money oh it's it's a tricky one do you remember yours reg or chris or yeah I, I bought um I, I think it might have been it might have been an underdogs album actually. It's a, a, underdogs they were a, they were a Auckland blues band and they had a minor hit in 1968 with a John Mayall cover of um, a song called Sitting in the Rain. And they you know they're a great band and I mean basically they just really did you know they basically did John Mayall covers really but that was a great version of that song and I'm pretty sure that was the first album I bought. If it wasn't them, it, I bought three albums from a uh, you know, one of those mail order things, and they were like three. Uh, one, one was Mississippi John Hurt, you know, the blues, uh, southern, you know, folk blues guy, and Lightning Hopkins, another folk blues artist, and um, the Jim Quiskin Jug Band. So it was either the Underdogs or those ones. I just can't quite remember. And with me, it was probably, I think it might have been um, a not as good as a wink to a blind horse by the faces, but which is maybe one of the first albums I bought also I also bought um possibly before that I bought um, Daddy Who Daddy Cool the Daddy Great Daddy Cool record of about the same period maybe a little bit earlier 1970 71 and then I might have also been buying things like um you know the 20 greatest hits compilations that were released all the time you know for for uh, 12 and 13 year olds they were always a good you know a good way into getting a lot of songs on a, on a um on a record off the hit parade but I, I also sort of probably inherited a lot of a lot of um, Reg's albums, you know, just from being the, the, a younger brother. Um, I grew up with, you know, having those records, his his record um, collection around me all the time. So I was probably borrowing a lot of those and listening to those before I started buying my own records. But I'm not as, as good as a wink to a blind horse. It's still a bit of a a, a landmark record for me, and that I still use it as a, a as a sort of. Um, a, a, a great go-to to listen to a, a, as a recording producer engineer you know we make our own records and I do it all at home so I, I think that the recording standard of that is is just so great you know there's everything sounds so good and the sound of a band playing with with um in a in a studio with just just with really you, you just really hear the band you hear the drums the bass the guitars and the and the keyboards so clearly um, and I think that's a sort of the high, high sort of high point for recording around about no, the early seventies, with just with the technology and the way they'd sort of expanded the, the desk to from you know four to eight tracks to, to sixteen tracks, and probably just before the twenty four tracks came in. But uh, they still sound outstanding those records. Yeah, I know the early Dog Trumpet albums were recorded on your sixteen track recorder. Were they all recorded that way? Yeah, they were actually. I mean, I had a I had an eight track, a uh, uh, Fostex eight track quarter inch, and then I expanded that up to. Uh, so I did some of the Dog Trumpet. Probably the second album was done on the quarter inch. Uh, then I got a sixteen track, and I did. We did at least two or three albums on that, um, on the half inch tape. 
uh, beautiful, beautiful technology. But unfortunately, the, um, the recording head was starting to wear out and I was losing tracks. So I went down from 16 to 15 to 14 tracks. And once it sort of, once I had the problem, oh, I almost get down to 13 tracks. So I was thinking I, even to buy a new recording head in Australia was a tricky thing then. There was only a, a handful of those recording heads in, in Australia. And, and this is going back, I don't know, 15 15 years or more and possibly 20 years and and the um the costs were high you know i thought oh will i will i go across to the dark side and get a um a computer and pro tools which i did you know and so the last two or three albums have been uh, done with with that new technology which is uh has its they both have their their, their strong points and this sound of tape still sounds really beautiful it's very hard to replicate that that analog sound but um at the same time, you know the the, the digital technology is is pretty amazing too. So you can you can get a pretty good sound out of it just by by working hard and using nice analog instruments and um, microphones, etc. Yeah, um, your albums are being re released on coloured vinyl on the the Demon label, um, which was started <laughs> by Jake Riviera and Elvis Costello. Um, those guys are not. Uh, connected to the label now, but uh, it's still, it must, must be a nice little uh, circle that you've come with uh, all the albums coming out on that label. Yeah, no, it's great. We're, we're very, very happy. And we were, you know, we were sort of uh, pleased that Demon was, you know, willing to um, invest in, in putting all our back catalog and, and the, it's funny too, the connection because um, with uh, Elvis Costello, because he, he produced a song for The Mentals a single um, called I Didn't Mean To Be Mean mm. back in, I don't know, 84, 85, maybe. Um, well, earlier than that, actually, probably more like 82, 83. Early, well, earlier, maybe it was, yeah. 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 Is there a, a dog trumpet album that's closer to your hearts than others? Um, oh, that's a hard one, really. I mean, like, each one you do, you know, is, is the one you think is uh, the strongest, you know, and the and the... The most familiar because you've been working on that um, over the recent times. But look, I think they all have their thing, and, and even the ones I, I mean, I sort of had dismissed the earlier couple of records, and I listened back to Suitcase not that long ago, and I thought, oh, that's it's pretty interesting record. You know, it's a bit like the a bit like the second album that the Mentals made, Espresso Bongo, um, which was also fairly, you know, at the time I thought quite ridiculous, but it had a couple of really interesting things on it. And uh, I think Suitcase is similar. It's 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 full of uh, interesting ideas. It's quite an eclectic sort of thing, and it was also done on on the eight track a lot of it. So had that mix of of a um, slightly more homespun sound, and and probably also recording at home. It has it's less it's less rock and roll than some of the other records, I suppose. It's got a, it's a little bit more folky and has more sort of um, slightly softer sound. The ones I could get away with at recording at home. I quite like the uh, eponymous record, um, but I, I guess I also like the double album because it's got a lot of songs on it. I think it's got some quite good songs on it, and it's got more more songs. So it'd be between those two for me. So you just going for quantity? I go for quantity. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it must be good. Must be good if there's a lot of stuff on it. Yeah. I, I think also I'd probably say like River of Flowers is still a bit of a favorite and in a personal way that was very much connected with family sort of stories and some of the songs so because our, our mum had had um been sick and passed away after having cancer around that time so we we both had songs about um about mum and about dad and about growing up in new zealand so it was probably a little bit closer to a a, a family photo album turned into song yeah oh, i have to change my mind they're all favorites there you go. <laughs> <Everyone is favorite. laughs> um, when you were still in the Mentals, um, were any Dog Trumpet songs put forward for that band, or have Dog Trumpet songs always been pegged for Dog Trumpet? No, they they were actually. There was um, uh, Quiet Night, which was I think on the eponymous album that was that was put up as a Mental song, and also oh. on the Handsome. I'm so handsome. We actually, which was on the first album, Two Heads One Brain, we, we recorded with the Mentals, yeah, and we had it, and the, and the, and it was an English producer we were using. Where it um, it never actually saw the light of day. It didn't was never released on anything, but um, he had uh, 
I think Greedy sang a verse and Martin sang a verse and you probably sang a verse. And mm. we did a version that was, you, you'd done a, a four track demo on your little four track cassette recorder, which sounded, I thought it sounded great, you know, and of course we, we didn't get anything sounding anything like that on the, on the oh, mantles of it. On the mantles, you know, it was, it was always a case of, you know, we, we stabbed around and did a lot of stuff and tried different things with songs. And sometimes it, you know, it was a bit hit and miss at times. And I thought all the albums had their, not all of them, but some of the albums had more more misses than hits as far as the artistic, you know, the control of it and, and what came out and, and how satisfied you were with it. But that one was re- definitely not living up to the, to the caliber of the actual song that you'd written. And I think that happened probably a few times with Mentals songs over yeah, the years. No, the, but the, the, the dog trumpet version was definitely better. Oh yeah, no, we just we just went back to the four track and listened to what you were doing there, and we just we we made a you know we made a good recording in a proper recording studio that uh, that you know it sounds still sounds pretty good that one made a good film clip for it too. Yeah, <clears throat> one of the great compliments Dog Trumpet received was from Bob Dylan, uh, who from side stage watching you said something like, uh, "Not bad." about the band uh, <laughs> yeah that's that, yeah. that's pretty yeah, that's pretty high praise from bob dylan i'd say yeah what do you yeah. remember what do you remember about that tour well uh, it, it wasn't a tour we only did one one gig oh, okay. supporting him at the um the state theater and um i mean again, again you know you, you we never saw him of course he doesn't he doesn't interact with people all that much um but uh, it was funny enough. I it was I've seen him a few times, and that 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 band I didn't particularly like for some reason. It's like I've seen him with a few bands, and I've always the, the other occasions I always enjoyed it more. So that was that was a that was a, a little bit disappointing. Mm. Whereas I, I I hadn't seen him before, so, and just getting to play with them, I was so excited by them, by that, and so I saw him in in a very different light. I thought, oh, this is amazing. You know, he said, what a great band. How good does that sound? <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah. You know, different take on the same thing but it was our, our roadie Sid at the time who used to work with the mentors which you know when we were in the some of the dog trumpet gigs like that one we, we thought we needed a bit of help there so we we actually had a roadie which we don't often have and uh he was the he was standing side of stage and and Bob said that to him he was just sort of came up to him sidled up to him and said not bad and I was not sure he must have said that during the sound check I, I think I'm not I'm not I don't remember yeah. so, are you both fans of Bob's artwork yeah, you know, I'm. I'm not hugely familiar with it. I've seen a few of his, um, of his, of his uh, paintings and drawings, and yeah, uh, they're not bad. I'm not a, a big fan. I quite like his sculptures. I've seen, um, you know, the sort of he does these sort of makes big sort of gates out of junk, uh, you know, all bits of rusty metal and junk, and I, I quite like that. They're quite good. I mean, you know, his 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 um, on paper works are, are good, but I, I would think they're amazing. I quite like the, the, paint, uh, the painting he did on um, the cover of Self Portrait. I thought was quite good. Not oh, bad. It's a, it's a bit like a, a, a lot of uh, musicians who do do art. You know, some of them are more serious than others, and uh, you can say he's a dilettante. A, a dilettante. Dillant, dillant, yeah. A dilettante. A dilettante. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've always thought it'd be interesting to put out a big coffee table book of all the. Um, musicians and actors that also do art because there's quite a few of them mm. including people like Sylvester Stallone I'm not sure of how good his stuff would be but and John Cooper, I'm, Bell and Camp, you know I'm obviously sure, I'm, people. I'm sure the, their work is amazing yeah and then, and then you know there's the more obvious ones like you know Ron Wood and uh, David Bowie and John Lennon but there's quite quite a, oh and um, um, Charlie Watts also was um, did stuff and so there's quite a lot of musician artists, I guess, because musicians are sitting around in their motel rooms so much they have to do something. Plus, plus a lot of those musicians, who, especially this, you know, English ones from the '60s, quite a few of them came out of art schools. That's right, yeah. You know, so and, and that's what happened to the Mentals. It was it was an art school band um, where where I was the the younger brother who wasn't at art school. I came out of high school and joined the Mentals in the, the year after I left, but. Just, just sort of being an outsider and, and watching these art art students who were supposedly at art school and supposedly doing doing work towards some sort of um, <laughs> art degree didn't seem like they were actually doing anything except for you know like going to drinking and and rehearsing with a band and you know I only ever really saw them at parties and pubs and things like that so I thought art school must be a great place to go to 
Yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was great. It was a real rort then. You didn't, I mean, it's quite, it's, a, it's, it's way more demanding now. I think they really make the students work. But for some reason, when I was there, you could pretty much stay home and just turn up occasionally and show them a picture and get your marks and, you know, and, and pass without, yeah, without basically turning up too much, which was, which I really uh, valued. Because yeah, you appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. We had plenty of time rehearsing and going to the pub. Yeah, you are, you're both visual artists. Um, is there a difference in your headspace between creating art and creating music? Not enormously. I, I think those the impulse for both comes from put the same area of the brain pretty much. I mean, you're scrubbing away with your your right hand um, and your left hand, if they're musically speaking. But um, I mean, obviously the forms are are quite different, but. Um, I find a lot of you know the, the subject matter and the themes and that I deal with in pictures are, um, bleed into the into the songs as well to, to quite a great extent actually um, and, and also I guess uh, you know, art's a little bit lonelier really and music that you're engaging with other people obviously to play in a band and you're engaging with the audience in a, in a closer yeah. way than artists do. So you, yeah, that's right. So it's a bit more um, socially. Uh, <coughs> interactive but uh you know being when, when after you know after the mentors and i sort of really um was getting heavily into art visual art i i found it a big relief actually that you know that i could be on my own doing this hermetic sort of thing you know it's great because you can you know you can you're only answering to yourself and not having to be in that collaborative kind of situation where that a band has and you know we had with the mentors it was always that dynamic of four songwriters and um uh, you know, having to, you know, often compromise on on what you were doing, not always getting exactly what you th thought, you know, should be the <clears throat> the result from from having you know written a song. But w with art, you know, you you it's just you, so it, it, it's very much you know, um, you know, you're in control. It's an independent thing. But um, but then after a while, you know, I, I realised that both things are really are pretty much the same thing, and it is part of the same part of your brain and and it's it's good having both because it, you know that thing of playing with other people is great too you know, and having a band and you know doing gigs is a completely different thing to 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 being alone in a room which can get quite lonely and you know has its own yeah pluses and minuses yeah. do the two ever merge do you find yourself painting a song that you're writing or vice versa well, you might, you, might, you, you, you might do a cover, you know, you might do a, a, an album or single cover for a song. So I guess there's that, that kind of, or, or, or you know, or, or a poster for a gig. So there is, there is some little bit of crossover in that respect. Yeah. Probably, yeah. For you. So I was going to say for, for Reg, definitely, because he has illustrated songs, specific songs, you know, and um, uh, there is a, direct crossover there but not so much with me because I'm sort of just I've just taken a painting as a separate kind of thing and and haven't done as much graphic sort of work as uh, I, I don't really do that kind of stuff like uh, Rich does but um oh you've done a couple of colors oh yeah well, way back and way back I have done a couple of things but but um you know they're, they're, it's it's the same it's the same thing really it's just a, you know I, I find that the the thing with the art and the music is that if I'm doing a lot of art, I, I feel a bit guilty because I'm not doing enough music. And if I do too much music, I feel guilty. I'm not doing too much art. So they, they eat, it, eat away at each other in, in a funny way. Yeah. Reg, you're, you're famous for creating some designs for the Mambo label, um, which has gone through a lot of ownership changes. And I believe it's currently <laughs> back in Australia. Do, do you have any connection to the label now? Yeah, no, I still, um, I still, I mean, I don't, do any new stuff that much very occasionally I mean they, they had a um, Mambo had a sort of like 30 year anniversary uh, four or five years ago and I did a poster for that and a couple of things and there were some art exhibitions and I'm still so I'm still yeah I mean they're still re-releasing -re some of the uh, old stuff and um, and there's a there's a Mambo another affiliation another sort of branch of the company separate in in England and they do on-demand t-shirts and stuff so I still still sort of, you know, um, involved to a small extent, yeah. I um, just want to talk about the, the gear that you've used in, in making dog, dog trumpet music. Um, the main guitars and basses you've used over the years, are you sort of emotionally attached to 
those instruments or have you chopped and changed a lot? Uh, a little bit of chopping and changing, but probably sticking with the same ones for quite a while now. I've, I mean, I've got an old Fender, 1968 Fender Precision, which I use a lot and I still do and I still my favourite bass. Um, so that's that's been over a lot of the recordings. But, you know, probably in the early days I had, I don't know, I had a couple of different uh, basses, but uh, I'm also using an, an Epiphone, um, I'm just sitting in the room with it now, an Epiphone a semi-acoustic. Uh, you know, fairly cheap, cheap sort of plug-in bass, but that's that sounds great too. You know, I use that quite a bit too. It's got a big fat sound, so. And I've got also got a uh, a replica, um, like sixty-one Beetle bass made by a guy called um, Piers Crocker, a Sydney luthier, who um, made a beautiful replica of that. So I use that sometimes too. So you know, yeah, that's that's the, the bases I use. But guitar-wise, I mean, I've got a Martin acoustic which I've been using for years now, and on the recordings, use that almost exclusively on, on on all the stuff I do. And I've, and I've mainly I've mainly used um, um, my old Strat, a 60, 68 or sixty nine Strat, and uh, also I, I use Hofner for slide guitar. Um, and I, the the one I use for years and years, a red one, is kind of the, the pickups have worn out a bit. So I got another another same model of Hofner, which I. Using yeah. now, apart from that, I, I mean, I, Peter's got a telly that I quite like, which I've been using a bit lately on recordings, and um, and a Gibson acoustic and a, and a Dobro. So those are the main things that I would use. Yeah. The Dobro resonate cars, we we use that quite a bit on, on things. Yeah, yeah. Um, slide, just for playing. But it's, 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 look, in, in a way, there's, there's not many more guitars than those ones we've mentioned, and we, you know, it's, even with microphones and things, I've got, you know, I've got a handful of microphones. It's really pretty basic what I use to make the recordings um, and we do it you know I mean I'm living in a house that I've been in for five years so it's just sort of the third bedroom in there smallish room that we do all the recording in and um, in previous houses I've done things like record drums just into the lounge in the lounge room or in the sunroom next to the to the bedroom where we where was recording so it's it's very much you know just use the whatever you got you know and use the surrounds we've got so it's not nothing Nothing technically perfect about anything we do, but uh, you know, could kind of just use my ears and try and make it work. Yeah, and Reg, you you played slide guitar a lot in your career. Um, what other slide guitarists have been an influence on you? Um, oh, I was a big fan of um, Hound Dog Taylor actually, um, and I saw him play in Sydney in nineteen seventy five or seventy six. Um, he was out here with a with a blues package of a few other acts, and I've always thought he was fantastic. But I mean, you know, I like people like uh, um, Matty Waters and um, Roy Cuda is, is a great player. But I mean, a lot of, lot of the um, you know African American players, I think, are, are, are fantastic. Um, um, and, and 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 in terms of uh, Australian slide players, my favourites would be uh, Peter Doyle and Johnny Gray, who. Used to play in a Sydney band called the um, Hawaiian House Wreckers. Both really good, wild slide guitarists. Not 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 enormously well known outside of the Sydney kind of blue scene. Um, but uh, yeah, th those are those would be the people that I like particularly. Yeah. So I, also also like um, I really love the um, um, the Fleet, early Fleetwood Mac blues band. Um, Guys, um, Jeremy Spencer was a was a great slide player. Yeah, uh, and I and actually um, probably the first the first um, great slide playing I heard was um, was the Stones doing a Little Red Rooster with um, Brian Jones playing slide. He, he was a great player too. Yeah. So what does the uh, the future hold for Dog Trumpet? Is is there another album in the works? Yeah, we we've we're sort of more than halfway through a, a new album, so. As soon as we've done that, that'll be coming out. No, we've been recording, getting together every week, and I've been spending quite a bit of time in the studio, especially during COVID. It's sort of, it's been, we haven't been able to do too many gigs. So that, in a way, is, um, you know, is, is a means I've got more time to be in the studio and just concentrating on so songwriting and um, and recording. So, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're pretty hard at it, and we've got a bunch of pretty good songs, and we've got a few new ones coming up. So, no. It's, I mean, still get pretty excited by doing the recording. It's um, in a way, it's the most satisfying thing 
you know, in being a musician is being able to see the songs, you know, come out of just being written on a, you know, just with an acoustic guitar uh, and worked up in a bedroom and then seeing them actually turn into something, uh, you know, in the, in the recording, it's, it's always exciting, you know, it never, that never loses its kind of its, um, that, that factor of, you know, making you enthusiastic about music, really keeping you enthusiastic. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, recording is is good fun. I mean, actually, writing the song is kind of fairly interesting too. You know, if, if you come up with a good one and you manage to finish it reasonably quickly, that's a that's a very satisfying feeling. And then, and then the recording. I mean, in, I mean, in a way, the probably playing live is fantastic, but it's it's got a lot of it's got its it's got its um you know, it's, it's can be reasonably stressful and, you know, just lugging your gear around and at late at night can be a little bit tedious at times, but, but there, there is a certain, you know, that, that thrill of playing, playing well with a good band to, a, to an appreciative audience is, is a pretty amazing thing as well. Yeah. And if COVID dies down, um, will you be Well, well, to... we get, yeah, we're going to do a world tour. We're going to do a world COVID tour. Yeah. <laughs> Pick up <laughs> what we left off with. We were releasing we, last year, like 2021. We were releasing um, uh, our our last album, um, Great South Road, which was you know coming out early in the year. And we had you know like a lot of musicians, we had gigs booked all over the place. We were going into state. We we're going down to Melbourne for the first time in, in a year or two. And so, of course, all of that stuff got got uh, canned and postponed at the time. But you know, still haven't really picked up on any of that stuff yet. But it's, so it's been hard on the on, on the music world, as we all know. It's been incredibly difficult so yeah, it's been devastating for for musicians i mean again we're you know we're fortunate because we're we're visual artists as well and we, that, that hasn't been as affected you know i mean I, I feel a great sympathy for the working musicians that just haven't been able to work you know i don't know what yeah they, i mean some, some of them being lucky to get some of the things like job keeper and job saver but not not everyone can access yeah. those um government handouts unfortunately yeah all right, guys, well, it's been great to chat um, and good news that all seven albums uh, will be available on vinyl from, yeah. from Feb 4. Three are available now. Um, I'm pretty thrilled about that. Also, the fact that the, you know, it's Demon Records based in the UK, so they're releasing them basically uh, internationally, which is, you know, it's a bit of a almost a shock to us because, you know, we've been, a, uh, you know, I suppose like an independent, you know, act here in Australia all these years and, um, working hard at it, but uh, never really. We've you know we've been to America and uh, New Zealand, but we've never really strayed too far beyond you know the, 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 the center of Sydney, really. So it's it's been uh, you know it's, it's it's a big thrill that they are releasing the records uh, around the world. We'll see what happens. It would be great to be able to go and do a little bit of touring over overseas, but um, well, we'll just have to wait and see what happens for all of us yeah. next year or two. All right, Reg and Pete, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having us on.